Dessau in Germany, a two-hour train ride from Berlin. Here in 1926, Walter Gropius built his higher academy for the arts, the Bauhaus. For the inhabitants of Dessau, the building that rose up before their eyes was a peculiar thing with its glass walls, right angles and flat roofs. It's one of the most famous buildings in the history of 20th century architecture. On December 4, 1926, a steam train pulled into Dessau station. More than 1,000 guests, some from very far away, had made the journey for the inauguration of the Bauhaus. With the building located on the outskirts, the guests first passed through a city rooted in the past centuries. On the evening of its inauguration, spotlights illuminated the facade. Shining like a beacon, the Bauhaus seemed to be a symbol of renewed hope and recovered vitality eight years after the tragedy of the Great War. Exhibitions, concerts, and theatrical performances followed one another over two days. A former student writes, The huge building leaves a very special impression, almost unforgettable at night when all its rooms are lit up as on the day of inauguration, forming a visible cube circumscribed by the metal frame of its outer shell. Politicians, artists, and company chairmen crowded around Walter Gropius. At 43, the architect of the Bauhaus was also its director. It all began in 1919 in Weimar, in a pre-existent public building without any particular architectural merit. Founded by Gropius, the Bauhaus movement, which literally means the art of building, aimed to reconcile art and crafts to create a new industrial aesthetic, what we now call design. Every discipline was mobilized. Metalworking, joinery, weaving, painting, but also stagecraft and dance. Color was taught in workshops run by Paul Klee and Vasily Kandinsky. Electrical appliances and furniture that continue to mark our daily lives were designed there. Experimental films were made. In 1925, the far right won the elections in Weimar and decided to shut down the school that was forced to find a home elsewhere. In Dessau, the city council, with its social democrat majority, released funds for the construction of a new home for the school that would give it a fresh lease on life. The city, with its 70,000 inhabitants, was an important industrial center. Dessau was an ideal location for an encounter between the aesthetic avant-garde and heavy industry. The land made available to Gropius was in a relatively isolated area, like this one, separated from the town proper by the railway line. The architect would not have to situate his building within the restrictions of the urban fabric. No sight lines or elevations needed to be respected. He was both the project's backer and its client. As a result, he could design a building adapted to the true needs of his school, the Higher Academy for the Arts with its workshops, an area for the administrative department, a collective area with a theater and a refectory, studio accommodation for the students, 
housing for the teachers, and a technical school to train young apprentices as requested by the Dassau City Council. He could give it any shape he wanted, a campus with dispersed elements, a huge building with an inner yard, a drawn out building. He opted for an interlocking system by linking the different elements in the deliberately asymmetric form. The school's different requirements determined the outline of the interlinked buildings. Each area has its coherence and specific design. The Bauhaus isn't an easy building to understand at first. One cannot immediately comprehend its form, meaning, and motion. To explain his design, Gropius liked to use aerial views. He claimed that the different sets of buildings and their layout then became clear. Junkers provided planes, and photographers revealed to the general public what modern architecture really was, suggesting that seeing the world from the sky would soon be the norm. Gropius, a resolute visionary, allowed all those who didn't yet have access to the airplane to abandon their static and passive approach to his work, and declared, You must walk around the building to understand its materiality and the function of its various elements. The Bauhaus cannot be comprehended from a single angle. The building requires movement to be understood. The pedestrian must start walking and, in looking for the school's entrance, will only find a discrete door that seems to deny that the center, or best angle for vision, as in classical architecture, is located there. A global style of architecture appears, with vast surfaces and different heights corresponding to the various needs of the school. On one side, you find the Higher Academy for the Arts, a parallelepiped that houses the large Bauhaus workshops, a bare and functional area which would be given every symbolic opportunity for expansion, without any walls or partitions to give an impression of enclosure. Here, architecture is triumphant. It's all one sees, whether one is inside the building or outside it, actor or audience. Gropius wanted this to be the most powerful element of his project, the image that would mark people. The technical school required by the city council with its classrooms. No grandiose walls of glass here, the students would be less exposed to the gaze of others, as if hidden a little. Walls and corridors break up the work areas. The architectural style is clearly less complete and less prestigious than that in other parts of the building. The collective area where students of the technical school, those of the arts school, and the teachers could meet. It's a place for performance, leisure, and encounters. On the facade, in the alternation of glass and concrete, Gropius shows that this is a protected and even slightly private area, different from the work areas. Housing for the students. 24 studio flats on four floors. This is the highest section of the building. The rooms extend out onto tiny balconies that provide a feeling of additional space. Here there are no large glass surfaces, and yet there's a rhythm that allows this facade to play with shadows and light, black and white, in the same way as the walls of glass. This is one of the elements that was most frequently copied by architects of the time. 
The school's administrative department, as well as the director's office, the one that Gropius was going to build for himself, also had to be at the center of the building, in a raised position, linking the two schools, Bauhaus and its workshops, and the technical school. In his initial sketches, Gropius already had the idea of a bridge. But he hesitated over its size. If it was too bulky, he would have to share this prestigious area. Too slender, and it would lack power. In the end, he decided on a two-story construction that would also house the most prized workshop in the school, the architecture workshop. This bridge will be built on stilts, highlighting the then fashionable cubist idea of the interpenetration of space. Having drawn the main outline and functions, Gropius had to decide on the orientation of the building. He would place it so that the sun in summer would wake the young students, thus reminding them of their first duty, a harmonious relationship with nature and hygiene, the guarantee of a new world. He would then locate the leading parallelepiped of the main workshop between east and west. All day long, the sun would flood the workshops with light. But since the sun has to set somewhere, he would give the technical school the final rays of light, leaving one final facade in shadow, the poor orphan of the building. But once the building was in use, did the young Dessau apprentices have anything to complain about? The heat that reigned in summer on the other side, in the prestigious Bauhaus workshops, made work unbearable, and soon opaque curtains were strung up everywhere, destroying the transparency that Gropius wanted. Similarly, in winter, the spacious workshops could be unpleasant to use since the steel structure tended to rust and was also very cold. Over the years, the metal structure had to be replaced with aluminum. Today, safety elements discreetly blemish the famous idea of a facade detached from the structure of the building. But Walter Gropius's brilliant idea is well and truly there. A facade bearing only its own weight without any link to the floor, like a curtain of glass. A simple facade that no longer plays the role of a bearing element in the building, leaving this task to the pillars set back from the facade proper. Industrial architecture was the perfect field to test new concepts. Gropius had already partially tested the glass curtain seven years earlier for one of his first commissions, the Fagus factory built with Adolf Meyer. But in Dessau, he saw his idea through by suppressing all attachments and masonry on the facade to build a surface totally in glass. America was his inspiration. The country that seemed to be building itself up each day at the start of the 20th century found its first defender in Gropius, well before Le Corbusier. Compared to other countries in Europe, Germany seems to have a lead in the field of industrial architectural art. But in the motherland of industry, in America, large constructions have seen the light of day whose unrivaled majesty outdoes our best German buildings of the same type. The grain silos of Canada and South America, the coal silos of the huge railway lines, and the most modern workshops of the North American companies almost bear comparison with the buildings of ancient Egypt. The Bauhaus was built in just over a year. It was a very short period. A point needed to be proved. 
Gropius adapted Henry Ford's theories for the construction of his cars by launching an assembly line on a worksite. In 1926, Gropius' American dream was completed in Dessau. The Bauhaus building immediately became one of the most filmed and discussed architectural works in Europe, as this footage from the 1930s shows. Everywhere one can see and be seen. Transparency is omnipresent. Does the Bauhaus really offer total liberty, or is it a place of oppression where all intimacy is banished and the group triumphs over the individual? Gropius, in any case, was able to survey the workings of his whole enterprise like a foreman from the bridge that he moved into. For several years, an atmosphere of unbridled creativity reigned in this place that its detractors looked on as a rather crazy experimental center. But had such a meticulous and even rigid building ever contained such energy before? Walter Gropius's project was essentially a practical one. He intended to show the industrialists just how rational his ideas were. Four stairwells lead to vast free surfaces, areas whose partitioning is adjustable at will. All superfluous elements have been removed. The load-bearing walls are highlighted. The pillars are strengthened and artistically designed. All the different areas communicate with each other. In this enclosed setting, the traditionally encased stairwells become vast and luminous meeting places that would inspire the photographers and painters of the school as the symbol of a new art of living. Everything was done to develop movement encounters and confrontation between students, areas, and disciplines. The Bauhaus Theater, a major element of the whole, is not a closed space. By simply opening a concertina partition, the canteen and theater become a single festive setting. Even the students' studio apartments are collective. There isn't a single space designed for withdrawal or solitude. The tiny balconies that appear on the facade favor conviviality without permitting collectivism. The flat roofs would be used as terraces and meeting places. You could live at the Bauhaus without ever needing to leave the place, one student remarked. To see a friend, you simply went out onto your balcony and whistled, said another. Like a town, the Bauhaus became self-sufficient. One witness relates, The quest for cleanliness, clarity, and liberality has triumphed here. Through the vast windows, one can stand outside and watch a man at work, or a man at rest in his private life. The construction of each element is clear. No bolts are hidden. All metalwork is revealed. You can tell which raw materials have been used. One is strongly tempted to judge this sincerity on a moral level. Rudolf Armen. What is usually hidden must be visible. Gropius deliberately stressed the industrial aspect of the radiators. On the main stairs of bourgeois households, it was the custom to hang a master painting, so he displayed a radiator. The time had come to admire present-day objects.
but this was a defeated and impoverished country. The backup was not always forthcoming. Gropius had to use the means at his disposal, and certain mechanisms are more like a reminder of the Europe of the previous century than the American ideal. For Gropius, this is a total architectural undertaking, down to the door handles and light switches. Convinced that the home and its furniture must have a sound relationship, at the Bauhaus we attempt to determine the form of each object according to its functions and natural constraints, thanks to a systematic process of theoretical and practical research in the fields of the shape, technique, and economy. The interior decoration was designed and built by the Bauhaus students. The metal workshop designed and manufactured all the lighting elements for the new buildings. The colors indicate the floors and workshop specialization. Paint is used for an architectural purpose. Through variations of colors, the rooms are structured and certain surfaces highlighted. Having completed his town factory school, Gropius still had one fundamental question to deal with. Where was he himself going to live, and how would he house the teachers? How could he reconcile the individual and the community in his global vision of architecture? He would make the decision not to include these private areas in the Bauhaus itself, but to build separate houses a few hundred yards from the school. Paul Klee, Vasily Kandinsky, and all the teachers, known here as the masters, would be slightly isolated, confirmed in their superior status. These houses would use the architectural techniques of the main building, but would perform a solo. As symbols of the bourgeois home of the future, they looked like show apartments, down to the slightest detail. A sort of advertising film praised the merits of the objects designed by the students or the Bauhaus teachers and the qualities of the individual home of tomorrow. Despite being a hymn to the art of living, the Bauhaus masters wouldn't be entirely happy in these houses. Apparently, Paul Clay didn't always feel comfortable in his showroom-like studio. As for Kandinsky, he couldn't stand being seen from the street and had all the glass walls painted white. At the same time, the architect's monastery-like white walls unsettled the painter. He had the whole place repainted in 170 different hues. The Bauhaus soon became an electoral bone of contention in the struggle between the left-wing city council and the increasingly popular Nazi party. Deemed decadent, Bolshevik, and cosmopolitan, the most famous art school of the modern era had to move with its students and teachers to the new premises in Berlin in 1933. Gropius would leave to join his American dream. The Bauhaus building remained as it was, abandoned by its detractors. The Nazis hesitated. What could be done with these flat roofs that appeared as a provocation to the German spirit? Some people suggested replacing them with something more Germanic, but gave up the idea. Others still perhaps dreamed of a few sizable structural modifications that would be understandable from the skies. In the end, they altered nothing and moved in, making it a school for girls, teaching cookery and sewing, 
On the eve of the Second World War, part of the Bauhaus became a training center for Nazi officials. In 1945, the building's facades were partially destroyed during the Allied bombing of Dessau, and Gropius's house was destroyed entirely. Then, in the New World Order, Dessau fell into the lap of East Germany. In the 1950s, the communists didn't like the Bauhaus either, considering in an official document that this school leads directly to the destruction of architecture. Even so, they didn't dare demolish the building and decided to leave it standing, hastily walling up the holes left by the bombs. To show that a page had been turned, a new private home was built on the site of Gropius's residence. Sloping roofs and geraniums were back. The other teachers' homes were left abandoned. Gropius died in the USA in 1969 after finding fame and radically altering the course of American architecture. It would be another 20 years before official opinion changed. In 1976, the Bauhaus was restored. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, the teachers' homes were turned into exhibition areas. In the training of a talented architect, the quest is what counts the most. I believe that we need to lead our future architects from observation to discovery from discovery to invention, and finally to urge them to use their intuition in giving artistic shape to our environment. UNESCO now lists the Bauhaus as a World Heritage Site. The building has been reopened to the public, part school, part museum. <laughs>